is good. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So good to see you here in Alamo. And those of you that uh, may be watching us online, we welcome you here. It's a great day. I love a new day. It's a new day and a new year. Yeah. And I, I know that probably some of you might have come in and you were with great anticipation anticipating 2020. You were really wanting a closure on 2019. I want you to know it's a new day. It's a new year. And I want to encourage every single one of us to open up our heart and to anticipate what God wants to say in us and through us and for us mm -hmm. in 2020. Yeah. Let's pray that prayer right now. Father God, I mm -hmm. thank you. We love you. We enter in, Father, into a, a time mm -hmm. of great anticipation of what it is that you want to say to us, Lord. We open up our hearts to you. Lord, we tune our ear to you. Father, I pray that this would be the day mm -hmm. that even today there's people that walked in here. They may have felt, um, you know, a little bit inhibited to walk through the doors, but they they knew you were nudging them. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray that today would be a day that they recognize your voice yes. and that you are speaking mm -hmm. to them. And Lord, I thank you, Father, that as we say, we want to commit ourselves to you. We want to commit this year to you. We want to commit our decisions to you. Lord, I pray that you would pour out your favor upon mm -hmm. all those that are saying, God, I commit to you. And Lord, I pray that you would give us all that it takes to walk it through. We make the commitment. Mm -hmm. Now, Lord, help us to walk in obedience to you. We give you praise, Father, for today and the message that is to come. In Jesus' name, amen, church. Amen. Do you agree with that? Amen. Let's give God some praise this morning. You may be seated. God bless you. Amen. Happy New Year. Happy New Decade. Right? You know, certain years are just a little different than the other years, and this is one of them where, you know, it turns over to a decade, and a lot takes place in a year, and a lot takes place in a decade. And so we're at the uh, threshold of something new, as Crystal just prayed. And one of the things I want to encourage you to do, and before I get into the message today, uh, it involves a Connect card. Um, if you're willing to make some public declarations. So this has to do with fasting. All right, it's a new year. Sometimes you need to fast for spiritual reasons, and some of you because you overate. <laughs> All right. How many would admit, admit you didn't eat so great the last couple of weeks, and maybe a fast would do you health, you know, good, do your body good, but, you know, a, a fast in the Bible is a, a commission time between you and the Lord to say, my body doesn't control me, okay? This is what it's about. I want to take some time, and what I would normally feed my body, I'm actually going to direct my attention to the Lord, and so a fast can involve a lot of different things. It, it can involve certainly uh, fasting all food, and it's just a liquid diet, for 21 days, it's gonna be 21 days. Um, Daniel had a fast and he fasted what was called the choice foods. And so for me, choice foods involve sugar that Ben spoke about a moment ago and, and chocolate. I've always put chocolate in the category of vitamins, vitamin C, <laughs> chocolate. And, um, and so it's a big sacrifice for me to give up sweets over the next 21 days, the things I, I crave and kinda of like, that might be yours. I always tell people, if you choose to give up caffeine, you have to get permission from those you live with. <laughs> All right, or at least tell them, warn them, that for 48 hours you might not quite be yourself, um, and so maybe it's caffeine, but why don't you do this? If you will join us for 21 days, uh, starting tomorrow and going through the 20, 20, 27th, what is today, the 6th, 27th, um, take and, and declare it. Don't just agree to do it. Why don't you tell us that you're going to do it? I think sometimes those kind of commitments make a difference of whether we follow through or not. And so you can just take one of these cards, write 21 days on it, write what you're going to fast if you already know that you're going to do that, and then turn this in at the end of the service. Make a commitment. You can turn it in at the back. Some of you might want to come up at the front where the prayer team is and leave it on the altar and say, God, this is a big deal. Like, how do I make sure I hear from you and I want to make sure I pray, not only for myself and my family and, and friends that I need to influence, pray also, a, a fast is for a nation. So like, in, in the nation of Israel, it was for the people of Israel. I think for a church, it's for the church. You know, pray for the church. Pray for our influence on our community in 2020. God wants to reach people in 2020. There's people here um, that you weren't here a year ago. There are people not here that are gonna come here in 2020 and get baptized in our church in 2020 because we took time to fast and pray for them. 
And so take advantage of this and write, um, write down that you're going to join us on a 21-day fast. All right? I want to begin and uh, encourage you to think about this for a new year. What if this is the year your faith dominates your fears? What if this is the year where rather than uh, feeling like I'm overwhelmed and, and the challenges have my greatest attention, what if faith takes us past where we are to where God wants us to be? What if faith, bold faith, actually leads the decade rather than just self-help? Rather than just my best effort, rather than even my wishful thinking, what if it's faith that actually drives us through into this year and into the decade ahead? That's what I want to declare over you. I believe that this can be a year of faith for you. But rather than just use the word faith today, I want to talk about a word that's a little more narrow than that, and one that's a a partner of faith, and it's the word favor. Say favor. Favor is actually something you see all throughout the Bible, and yet in in the 20 years of New Life Church, I've actually never done an entire series on favor, and I'm going to do it this January, and so I encourage you to start today. My rule is this. If you're here at the beginning of the series, you have to be here for every part of the series. Okay, you didn't know you signed up for that when you pulled in the parking lot today, but I'm just telling you. So you'll be here for the series on favor here in January. Favor is God's blessing, help, and power to accomplish his special purpose for my life. Would you say that with me? God's favor is his blessing, help, and power to accomplish his special purpose for my life. The Bible says this of Jesus. And he increased, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in what? Favor Favor with God and man. How many want to be more like Jesus? All right, you need to not just get older, you need to increase in wisdom and in favor with God and man. This verse tells me you can increase in favor. This tells me that you can have more favor this year than you did last year. This verse tells me that you can have more favor in the decade ahead than you had the decade behind. You can increase in favor with God and man. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, that's Jesus though. Of course, Jesus increases in wisdom and favor because he's Jesus. Well, I wanna take you to a couple other verses today. And one of them is what Jesus actually said. Early in his ministry, Luke chapter 4, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim, say proclaim, Proclaim. to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to what? Proclaim Proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind and to set the oppressed free. And then one more time and to Proclaim. proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down, which was their posture for teaching. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened upon him. He began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, when Jesus came, more of God's favor came. And Jesus wasn't saying it was just for him. Jesus is proclaiming it over people. He's actually proclaiming it over a year. Did you catch that? He said that proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. God, through Jesus right now, is saying there's something available for you in this year. And you actually need it to accomplish his purpose. It's not just for Jesus, but I will tell you this. It is about Jesus. The ultimate expression of God's favor is Jesus himself. If you want to know the greatest blessing you can ever have, it's Jesus. If you want to know what favor is really all about, it's Jesus. You need more of Jesus in your life. If you're here today and he's not at the center of your life, favor isn't about getting a whole bunch of nice things from God. Favor is getting Jesus at the center of your life. The other things come in because you have to fulfill his purpose and you can't do it without his power. You can't do it without his direction. You can't do it without his provision. And so you need Jesus and the resources that he brings with him to accomplish what he put you on this planet to accomplish. How many of you had the chance to be with us at one of our um, Christmas Eve services? All right. It was, it was, I think they were the best Christmas Eve services we've ever had, and I just want to ask you to do this. Would you thank our worship team, too? Man, the, the music was fabulous, and, and uh, such, such a powerful time. And the part that I got to have 
and it involved the teaching that had to do with the word um, glory. The ultimate purpose of your life is to know Christ and to celebrate and reflect his glory. I actually said that when glory goes up from you to God, favor from God comes down from him to you. When glory goes up, God's favor comes down. There's something about recognizing you were made to have Jesus at the center of your life and you were made to glorify God and when Jesus is at the center, more of God's favor comes onto your life. He comes into your life, but more of his favor also comes onto your life. You need God's favor to do God's will. You cannot do it just because you try harder. You cannot do it just because you're a church person or a Christ follower. You actually have to feel like you're not just following Jesus because you know that it's good to follow Jesus. He has to be at the center. You can't just have Jesus at the center on Sunday and then on Monday to, to Saturday live like the world. Jesus is the center of your life um, if he's the center of your life every day. And when favor, um, when, when God's at the center and you're trying to know him and, and your life is about glorifying him, more favor can come down to you. The ultimate purpose of your life is to know Christ and to celebrate and reflect his glory and we need God's favor for that. The good news is God will give you his favor. God will show up in your life when you invite him into your life and then he'll keep bringing things to you to strengthen you, direct you, help you, so you can become everything he wants you to become and do everything he wants you to do. Let me give you a couple examples. Samuel, this is a guy in the Old Testament, it was said of him virtually exactly what it was said of Jesus. He grew in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. In other words, favor wasn't just for Jesus. How about Joseph? I love this one too because even when others did him wrong, even when others pushed him down, either, even when others literally um, created perhaps the biggest setback in history, the biggest setback became his biggest set up. They actually sold him out, sold him, and yet God used that as a moment in which his favor found him. God can find you even in your difficulty. Favor can find you even in hardship. Just because somebody pushed you down doesn't mean favor can't find you. And that's this story. It says the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God. Can somebody say, but God? Those are two favor words right there, but God. Like, yeah, somebody rejected you. Yeah, somebody sold you out. Yeah, somebody pushed you down, but God. You know, if you have a theological but God in your life, what was said before the but God really doesn't matter so much. When but God shows up, then God can do something in spite of what other people did, amen? Yeah, they pushed you down, but God's going to lift you up. Yeah, they sold you out, but God's going to set you up. This is one of the biggest setups in history. He goes from the prison to the palace. And God did that because of God's favor. But God was with him and rescued him out of all of his affliction and gave him, what's the word? Favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all of his household. Another person is Ruth. I love this story too because sometimes favor from God comes to you through the hand of a human. Many times it does. And in Ruth's case, um, it involved a guy named Boaz. That Boaz begins to bless her. He doesn't just meet practical needs. He meets some spiritual needs. But here's what it says of her. Then she fell down on her face, bowing to the ground, and she said to him, said to Boaz, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? Here's the, here's the interesting thing about that story. You don't have to be in the right social circle for favor to find you. You don't have to be in the right position, you know, as far as the world is concerned. She describes herself as a foreigner. In other words, she was not Jewish. Most of the stories of the Old Testament are about the Jewish people and the favor of God that was on the Jewish people. But here she's a foreigner. She's recognizing, I wasn't in the right circle. I wasn't born into the right family. I didn't have the right starting point, but favor found her in spite of all that. You know why? Because she honored her mother-in-law. You gotta read the story. But honor positioned her for favor, and favor changed her life. He didn't just meet practical needs. God would use that relationship with Boaz to write this Ruth lady, this foreigner lady, into the genealogical line of Jesus himself. Come on, is that not a great setup that one day you're outside of the right circle and God not only put you inside the circle, God wrote you into the biological line of what God wanted to do. 
Amen for that. Pastor Doug, that's good stuff, first part of the year. I don't know what you were eating, but that sugar didn't do it all bad to you. Don't underestimate the value of honor. I might actually do a series this year on honor because it's so valuable in what we do with that word that positions us for favor. That's Ruth's story. How about Mary? The angel went to her and said, greetings you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. One day you're just a teenage girl. One day you're just poor. One day you're just trying to serve God and be faithful to God and honor God and favor finds you. Here's the, here's the great thing about God's purpose. Don't worry so much about finding God's purpose as much as seeking after God. Purpose will find you. His purpose will find you. Favor will find you. Don't, don't, don't just seek after the things God can give you. Just seek after God and the things come after that. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things start coming your way. Mary is just a, a young girl and God's favor finds her. He need, she needed favor in the form of a miracle because the Messiah needed to come through miraculous means. And so she's gonna get pregnant miraculously. So sometimes favor is in the form of miracles. You can't do that. I can't do that. God can do that. Some of you are gonna see some miracles in 2020. Part of your destiny involves the miracles that God's gonna bring into your life. And what you need to focus on is Jesus himself and favor will find you and the miracles that you need will find you and God will all of a sudden catapult you from where you were to your destiny like he did with Mary. That's a great story in the Bible. So here's what I want you to learn about all that. You do not earn God's favor. It's like grace, it's a gift. You do not earn God's favor, but you can be out of position to receive it. If you don't have Jesus at the center of your life, I'll just tell you once again, you are out of position to receive God's favor. It's not just about coming to church, it's about putting him at the center of your life. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that you're here at church. Generally in January, the parking lots are full at churches and gymnasiums, <laughs> churches and, and fitness centers. And, uh, and, and so I'm glad you're starting this out right, but here's what I want for your life. Don't just have Jesus, Jesus at the center in January, have him in the center of February, have him in the center of March, have him in the center of July, have him in the center of November. Come on, 2020, Jesus is at the center. And then you don't earn this, even glory. When you give God glory, you're not earning favor. You've positioned yourself for favor. Glory is just you saying, I got my eyes on Jesus. I want my life to reflect him. That's just positioning yourself in the right place and all of a sudden glory, glory turns into an avenue for favor to come into your life. How many were here um, the last I guess it was last Sunday. How many were here last Sunday? Last Sunday of the year. Heard Crystal Smith? And it's such a powerful word. And uh, here's the interesting thing. All of a sudden, because I never told her what to speak on. I never told her what I was going to speak on today. And all of a sudden, she's talking about the, the, the decade of the mouth. Remember that? And uh, she, she, just, she declared things over us. She, she talked about the importance of the decade of the mouth. And then right after first service, I held it my, because I already had my outline done for today, and I, which was unusual, but Christmas was coming and New Year's was coming. I had to get my work done early. And, and so I pull up my phone and I said, Crystal, look up my message title for Sunday. You got to get your mouth right. She ended 2019 with the mouth. I'm beginning 2020 with the mouth. I wonder if God didn't want to tell some of us something about our mouths. And so today I want to kind of focus the rest of today on that. And I want to give you this today. Aligning my words, here's really the first principle. Aligning my words with God's word is an essential part of positioning myself for more of God's favor. Aligning my words. In fact, say this with me. Aligning my words with God's word is an essential part of positioning myself for more of God's favor. The Bible says a lot about your mouth. It says specifically a lot of things about our tongue or our talking, and it affects the topic of favor. Let me ask you a question. You can raise your hand on this one too. How many would say you know your mouth can get you in trouble? How many would just admit to this, all right? All of us, all right, we know this. But you know what? The opposite is also true. The same mouth that can get you in trouble is the same mouth that can position you for favor. You know that? That you can begin to align your mouth with the ways of God and the word of God, and when you use your mouth accordingly, more of God's favor can come your way because your mouth has a me is a means in which God brings favor into our lives. I want to take you to a verse that perhaps 
I, I suspect all of you know it, even if you're not a church person, even if this is your first time in church and you don't consider yourself a Bible person, I bet you've heard Psalm 23 read somewhere. And maybe you've never thought about Psalm 23 in regards to favor, particularly in regards to using your mouth appropriately. David actually models what I'm talking about. Psalm 23, even though, even when I walk through the valley of death, I, w I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect me and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You welcome me as a guest, anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. You see what David's doing? He's aligning his word with God's word. He's not denying his valley. He, he, he gives his valley a, 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 a moment of attention, but the focus of his word is not on the dark valley. That's just the setting for which he can begin to declare God's word. Yes, I'm in a dark valley, but you are with me. You know God's with you, not because you want him to be with you. God is with you because he said he's gonna be with you. That's God's word. That's not my wishful thinking. I'm not making stuff up saying, you know, God's with me and I just made that up. No, that's, that's God's word. God has said all the way through the Bible that he's willing to be with us and he actually is with us, but we just gotta acknowledge him. David is saying, I'm going through a dark valley. I got eyes of faith, but I also got a mouth and I'm proclaiming something. I'm not alone in this valley. God is with me and he, and he has a rod and a staff. How many are glad your shepherd has a rod? and knows how to use it. You know what, sometimes you don't have to do everything. Sometimes God's rod and staff will protect you and take care of you. And there's a, there's a shepherd that's going before you, and then, I love this analogy, and goodness and mercy, or goodness and your, your unfailing love or unfailing kindness are coming behind me. If you ever travel to Israel, and um, by the way, you can use your same uh, Connect card that you wrote 21 days on, I know all of you did that already. You got your 21-day card out already, yes, 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 okay. You can also, if you want to learn more about the Holy Land, we're gonna take a Holy Land tour this September. And uh, I'll send you information if you write that on there, but if you wind up in the Holy Land, here's what you'll see. You'll still see uh, Bedouins, like they were you know, in David's time, 2,000 years, 4,000 years ago, same kind of Bedouin outfits. They're out there, they're, they, they're, they're nomadic, they're still living in tents. The only difference is they have a truck and a satellite dish, all right? And, and yet everything else is largely the same. And oftentimes what you'll see is a shepherd out in front of a certain amount of sheep and behind the sheep will be a dog or two because as the shepherd leads from the front, there's, there's dogs that are pushing him in the direction of the shepherd. That's David basically saying, you know what's behind you? The shepherd dog of goodness is coming behind you. The shepherd dog of God's unfailing love because the Bible says we all like sheep tend to wander. You know what you need if you wander? You need a sheep dog to get you back following the shepherd. You need, a, you need goodness and you need God's mercy pushing you forward, pushing you closer to the shepherd. And David is just acknowledging that. Yeah, I'm going through a hard time, I'm going through a valley, but God's, God's leading me, God's provision is with me, God's protection is over me, and I'm going through the valley, I'm not staying in the valley. How many if you had 2019 as a tough year know that your valley has an ending point, but the goodness of God goes with you forever? His mercy is new every morning, and his goodness follows us all the days of our lives. And so David is verbally superimposing God's word over his current circumstances. Aligning my words with God's word is an essential part of positioning myself for more of his favor. You can talk so much about the valley, the shadow of death, things you don't like about your body, things you don't like about your marriage, your jobs, your skill, your looks. We can so verbally align our lives to our worries, our fears, our frustrations, and the things we don't like that our lives actually move in that direction. Or at some point, we can begin to align our words with God's word, and now all of a sudden, our life starts moving us towards the good shepherd, moving us in the direction God wants us to go. Our words can do that. So let me give you another principle today. Your mouth cannot manufacture something God has not declared. Okay, this, there, are, there is teaching out there. It's outside of the Christian circle that basically if you say it enough times, you believe it enough, you, you speak it enough to the universe that the universe will give you whatever you want. That's not in the Bible. 
You can't speak your valley out of existence and you can't speak everything you want into existence. That's not what the Bible teaches. But what it does teach is you can miss out on many things he does have for you if you don't use your mouth the right way. You can't manufacture everything, but boy, you can sure miss out. And we gotta learn how to do this. We gotta verbally align our lives with God's word. And when we do, we're in greater position for his favor. Let me take you to another passage. James chapter three. He gives this analogy, a couple of them. We make a horse go wherever we want to by a small bit in its mouth. We turn its whole body by this. Sailing ships are driven by strong winds, but a small rudder turns the large ship whatever way the man at the wheel wants the ship to go. The tongue is also a small part of the body, but it can speak big things, either the right way or the wrong way is what the inference is. See how a very small fire can, be, can set many trees on fire. These verses, along with Psalm 23, are basically saying, your tongue will direct where you go. You know where you're going to be in 2030? In many ways, where your tongue takes you. What, we, what you talk about. Your, marriages fall and fail oftentimes because words that were said over and over and over, things that shouldn't have been said, things that shouldn't have been said to other people. You know, sometimes marriages fall apart because somebody's talking to the wrong person too many times and that gets them in trouble. And so where your marriage is gonna go is largely affected by your tongue. Sometimes careers are made and lost by people's words. You, you probably all know people, sometimes they're, they're celebrity type of people, and all of a sudden they've lost a job because of one thing they said. Didn't know the microphone was on. Didn't know that somebody was gonna pay attention. Didn't know that that came out the way it did, and all of a sudden their tongue got them in trouble. But also, sometimes the right thing at the right time actually moves a person forward. Our tongue has an effect on our careers, on our purpose, on our spiritual lives, and it's not, <clears throat> it's not just because we say it's that way, it's because God says it's that way. This is not wishful thinking. This is not name it and claim it. This is spirit-filled God's word thinking. This is what God's word says. And so let me give you a few examples of what you can do. You know, every year has the potential financially to be a good year or a difficult year. And oftentimes it's actually a little bit of a cycle of up and down. It's not always going up and up and up. And sometimes it is, but you know, for most people there's some ups and some downs. And what do you do during the down times? How do you talk about finances there? Sometimes when it's the worst, what if you lose a job that you didn't expect to lose? You know what you can say? Well, there it goes again. There it is. You know, other people get favor, but I've lost my job. You know, God's not faithful. God let me out. You know, let me down. This thing isn't going to work out. I might not make it anymore. Like, you can use your mouth that way, or you can actually say something like this. You know what? I lost that job, but I serve a God who's still with me. I got a God who can open doors that mo no man can close. Like, I may not have what I want right now, but I got a God who leads me and guides me. I'm actually believing that God will take this circumstance and he's gonna work it out for good because I've surrendered myself to his purpose. That's what you can begin to talk about. We can all talk about what's bad and what's wrong, but it's people of faith that begin to talk about where they wanna be. How about when you look at a year and some, some years feel like they're overwhelming? You know, some of you are, are thinking, I didn't even get my to-do list done of 2019, and here I had to bring up, you know, my to-do list into 2020, and you're already starting the year out feeling overwhelmed. You can talk about all your, your, your things that overwhelm you. You can talk about all the challenges. You can get up every morning and talk about how tired you are, or you can get up and just say, you know what, today is the day that the Lord has made. I'm gonna rejoice and be glad in it. I'm actually not somebody that gets overcome. I'm an overcomer. Do you know that Jesus or God said that to you? If you're a follower of Jesus, you're not somebody that gets overcome. You're ultimately someone that's an overcomer. Why don't you get up in the morning and say today I'm gonna to overcome. Monday's not gonna overcome me. I'm gonna be an overcomer that God called me to be. This circumstance isn't gonna overwhelm me. I got a God, I might feel weak, but he's got a strong arm. How many appreciate the fact that God's got a strong arm even when you're weak, and he lifts you up? Man, I love the stories in the Bible where it talks about God lifting us up, holding us in the palm of his hand, watching over us. You know what, you can talk about the difficulty, you can talk about the God who holds you up. This thing might not be going your way, but you know what? That's not the end of the story. So oftentimes, you know, people come to church and they praise God on Sunday and then a bad thing happens on Monday and then complaining comes out. 
Can I tell you something about complaining? You didn't have to teach yourself how to do that. It just came natural, didn't it? You know what? Certain things are just part of our sinful nature. And man, you got to teach yourself not to complain. You know, the Bible says, in all things give thanks. And so there's a time in which we gotta, we got to eliminate the complaining and, and, and rise up with thanksgiving and say, God, that thing didn't happen the way I wanted it to, but I thank you that you got a better plan. You know what? My plan was down here and it fell apart, but your plans are higher than my plans. You know, I had some thoughts about this. It didn't go the way I thought, but your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. God, thank you that you're already out in front of me. Thank you, you're already working things out. You're already in July of 2020 setting stuff up, and I'm not even there yet. So thank you, God, you've already gone ahead. I'm looking for you. I'm looking for your favor. I'm not going to get discouraged. I'm going to stay in faith. That's the way the people of God talk. Some of you are going to get fixated on a number on a thing called a scale. You're going to stand on that, and the number's not going to be the number you want. And then you're going to start thinking about all your flaws, all the things you don't like about your body. And a lot of that has to do with comparison. What if we decided that 2020 was not going to be a year of comparison? It was going to be a year to follow God's calling. God hasn't called you to be like anybody else. I'm not saying don't take care of yourself. I'm not saying, you know, you know, damage your body or things like that. But at some point, you are more important than a number on a scale. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Sometimes you need to stand up in front of a mirror and just remind yourself, I can see myself. That's worth thanking God for. I might not like all I see, but I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I might have some things I want to work on, but I'm not going to let a number on a scale set my self-esteem for today. I'm going to get up and go out and remind myself I'm a daughter of God. I'm a son of God. I'm a man of God. I'm a woman of God. And I'm going to fulfill the call of God for today. Don't let a number on an on a instrument set the course of your day. Let this year be a year where you don't envy other people. Your destiny is important. And what's important is you follow your destiny and not envy somebody else's. Those of you that are married, you know one of the things you can do in your marriage? You can focus on all their flaws or you can find some awes. <laughs> every marriage has some awes and every person has some flaws. Your spouse has flaws, but so do you. So do all of us. We're all flossom, all right? <laughs> Why don't you remind yourself of that? You know what? My spouse is flossom. <laughs> I'm going to emphasize the awe, not the flaw. I'm going to compliment them for what I do appreciate. You know what? We got the rest of our lives to work some of this stuff out. We don't need to get caught up every single time in an argument and where we, you know, like you know, at some point you just need to remind yourself that I need to speak life into my marriage. I need to be, speak life and encouragement into my mate. Yeah, I might not like everything, but so what? She probably doesn't like everything about me either. Those of you that are parents, I know you need to correct your kids. I know there's times where you need to say no. I've actually been in church and watched some of you, and you needed to say no to your kids, all right? All right, so I'm just saying, there is a time to correct. There is a time in which to say no. But you know what you need to do as parents? Catch them doing the right thing. Get it in the morning. Remind them, because they're going to go in a world that's all about comparison. They're going to go into a world that's all about comparing one another, and they're on their phones, and they're seeing this, and they're seeing that. They just need to be reminded by a parent who has faith to speak life over your kids. Remind them they're fearfully and wonderfully made. Remind them that God's got a call on their lives. Remind them that they can be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, and that their friends don't have as much power over them as the Holy Spirit could have power on them. Build up your kids in the faith. Those of you that are teenagers, honor your parents. That's it. That's all I got, all right? <laughs> honor your parents. <laughs> honor your parents. That's your job. Just honor your parents and more favor will come into your life. For all of us, I bet there's some things you're going to need to let go of for you to receive more of God's favor. In fact, I'm going to talk about one of them next week. Some of you can't receive all the favor God wants to give you because your hand is full of something else that you need to let go of. And if you want more of God's favor, you can't just keep holding on to this and pray the prayer, God, give me your favor, God, give me your favor, because your hand's already full of the wrong thing. 
you got to let go of the wrong thing. Sometimes you got to walk away from the wrong people. You know, here's David. David acknowledges the fact that he's got some enemies. But you know what he does? He reminds himself, in spite of my enemies, God set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I'm not going to focus on what somebody did or what somebody didn't do. I'm going to focus on the fact that there's a big barbecue God just set in front of me. There's blessings, and the table's all set, and God's invited me to the table of blessing. Don't let other people rob you from the table God set for you. And in this year, that's going to involve some declarations. And this is the last one today. The declarations of my mouth will affect the destiny of my life, the destination of my life. The declarations of my mouth affect the destination of my life. You cannot go around talking defeat all day long and expect the victory of God. You cannot just read God's word, even agree with God's word. We are to declare God's word. Yes, we're to obey God's word, but we are to declare it. That's what David was doing. That's what James is teaching us to do all through the Bible. That's what Jesus modeled when he stood up in front and he's proclaiming things. He's declaring things. What if even this week you just took more time at the beginning of a day to remind yourself who God is? If you don't know some of his descriptions, just go back to Psalm 23. I already gave you the verses. Just do that. God, thank you that you're a good shepherd. Thank you that I'm not alone. You are always with me. Thank you that you're a provider. Thank you that you're a protector. Thank you that you guide my life. Thank you that you carry me forward. Thank you that you set a table in front of me. I'm going to come to the table of blessing because you're a God who blesses. The table of blessing is there because you got a God who blesses people. Remind yourself that God is a good God even when life isn't good. God's got a table even even when people aren't good. Come to the table of God. Come to the presence of God. Hang around the people of God and position yourself for the favor of God. To do that, though, you got to start using your mouth the right way. Talk about God this week. Begin to thank God for what he's going to do. Even today, before we get out of here, we're going to go into a few songs of worship. During worship, can I encourage you to do this? Sing the songs, okay? Put your mouth into into action. But even today, in your mind, maybe as you're pausing during some of the songs, start thanking God for what he's going to do in 2020. You know what? You don't have to thank God always after he did it. You can thank him in advance. That's called faith. God, thank you. You're going to be with me. In in July, I don't know that I'm going to go through an easy time or a hard time, but in July, you're going to be with me. Thank you, Jesus. You're already out in front of my July. You're already out there in August. You're already out there in September. God, thank you. You already lined the person up. You already arranged the thing. You already are working in my future. God, thank you. You're already out in front of me. You can do that today. Many of you need to do this. You need to thank God for his forgiveness that already has come into your life, or today you need to receive his forgiveness. And right now you just need to say, thank you, Jesus, that you're willing to forgive a sinner like me. Thank you, Jesus, you're willing to to pay the price. You already paid the price for my sin. Thank you that you're willing to make me your, your, your focus, that I can become one who old things pass away and all things become new. Start thanking God for his salvation, for his help, for his healing, for his provision, for his wisdom, for his direction, for his blessing on your life. Even thank him today. So I'm going to pray over that. In fact, I'm going to pray just a little differently. I'm going to begin to declare this stuff over your life. And I'm going to encourage you to do the same all throughout this series. Let's learn to talk differently. Let's learn to not just pray. Sometimes we need to declare. We don't just need to ask. We need to, in faith, declare what God's already said. Let me do that over you today. Jesus, thank you that you're a good God, and we acknowledge you as our Savior, as our shepherd, as our leader, as our guide, as the favor, the ultimate expression of the favor of God. Thank you. You've made yourself available to us for those needing salvation today. I I believe right now forgiveness is flowing across this room. Some of you walked in here with guilt and shame and regret, and right now favor is flowing in the form of forgiveness, and you just need to thank God for it and receive it. Favor is washing over sin. 
favor is healing broken hearts. The, the favor of God that comes in the form of healing is touching a person's heart and mind. Yeah, somebody abandoned you, but God is with you. Somebody did something to you, but God's going to take that and set you up for something better. Somebody needs the wisdom of God. You're so concerned about all the things yet to do and how to even accomplish the purpose of God. But right now, I believe peace is flowing. Favor is flowing in the, in the form of peace over somebody's mind. I, I pray you just receive it right now. Just start thanking God for the peace that he's going to give you, the sleep he's going to give you, the rest he's going to give you, that the weight he's going to lift off your shoulders. I believe some people that have been walking under weight, weight is going to lift off your shoulders as you start worshiping God. Worship is another place in which we position ourselves for the favor of God. And when you lift your hands in worship today, there's going to be something that comes down in the form of God's strength in your life. What weighed you down when you walked in, God's going to lift you up and you're going to feel stronger before you walk out of here today. Some of you are discouraged, but God's courage is going to come over you. Some of you are, feel like you just, you just can't get a break, but you know what? God's going to open a door, and I want you to start thanking him for it even now. Lord, I don't know when it's going to come. I know things are in your timing. But even now, I thank you for the door that's going to open. I thank you for the relationship that's going to happen. I thank you for the provision you're going to give. Even now, Jesus, I believe you're giving thoughts to people about the favor that you want to bring into their lives as they put you at the center. So receive our worship, Jesus. Glory is going to go up to you. And I declare right now, favor is going to come down on your people today and in 2020 in an increased way. Do that today. We receive that. If you receive that, why don't you say it a little bit with your mouth and a bunch with your hands, and let's go into a time of worship together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.